Hello everybody, welcome from my home office. I'm Ulrike Gehring and I'm an associate professor in environmental child health at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. First of all, I would like to congratulate the organizers for putting this online meeting together in these very challenging times. Also, I would like to thank them for inviting me to talk about the role of air pollution in child lung health, a topic that has been the topic of my very first ISEE presentation back in 2001 in Garmisch, Germany, and has been of a focus of my research ever since. Birth cohort studies have been instrumental in understanding the long-term consequences of air pollution exposure for children's lungs during the past two decades. With my talk, I would like to provide an overview of findings from birth cohort studies with a focus of results of and experiences from large collaborative studies. Air pollution exposure is associated with many respiratory health endpoints. For this talk, I decided to focus on two endpoints, asthma and lung function. I selected asthma because it is one of the major non-communicable diseases and the most common chronic disease in children, and it affects more than 300 million people worldwide. It's a heterogeneous disease, usually characterized by chronic airway inflammation and is defined by a history of respiratory symptoms that vary over time and in intensity together with a variable expiratory airflow limitation. It can develop at any age, but most asthmatics develop their first symptoms in childhood. Asthma is a major cause of hospitalization among children. It's associated with high medical costs and creates large burden to individuals and their families. And it often restricts individuals' activities for a lifetime. I selected lung function as the second health endpoint for this talk because lung function is an objective marker of respiratory health and a predictor of cardiorespiratory morbidity and mortality. As you can see in this figure, lung function grows throughout childhood and adolescence into early adulthood where it reaches its maximum. Lung function tracks throughout life, which means that the maximum attained lung function in early adulthood likely will be suboptimal in those with a low lung function in childhood, which put them at an increased risk of developing chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in adulthood. Results of a recent study within the Framingham Offspring Cohort, the Copenhagen City Heart Study and the Lovelace Smokers Cohort suggest that about half of the persons with COPD had a low lung function in early adulthood. Air pollution, that's the many particles and gases that surround us. Particulate matter is a complex mix of particles with different sizes and composition originating from various sources. It includes primary particles emitted from combustion sources and secondary particles that are formed in the atmosphere from precursor gases. It also includes resuspended soil and biological material. Traffic is a major source of air pollution in many parts of the world. Combustion of gasoline or diesel fuel by motor vehicle leads to the emission of several pollutants, including nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds and suspended particulate matter. Moreover, Traffic spreads and resuspends substantial amounts of particles originating from the wear of tires or brake components and abrasion of road surface material. Traffic-related air pollution is a major concern since traffic emissions occur very close to places where people live, work, walk and commute. The burning of fossil fuels at industrial plants and power plants, and for domestic use, such as heating and cooking, is also a major source of air pollution. High temperature combustion can be a source of nitrogen oxides and also sulfur dioxide if sulfur is present in the fuel. The size of suspended particles varies from a few nanometers to tens of micrometers. This figure gives you an impression of the size of suspended particles compared to a human hair and fine beach sand. We classify particles by size. We differentiate PM10, the so-called thoracic particles that are smaller than 10 micrometers in diameter and that can penetrate into the lower respiratory system from PM2.5, the so-called respirable particles that are smaller than 2.5 micrometer in diameter and that can penetrate into the gas exchange region of the lung. 
and with the so-called ultrafine particles. They are smaller than 100 nanometers. They are not depicted here. Ultrafine particles contribute very little to particle mass, but are very abundant in terms of numbers. The largest particles, the so-called coarse fraction, are from mechanical processes, resuspension of dust and biological sources. Smaller particles are largely formed from gases or originate from combustion processes. The penetration of a pollutant in the respiratory tract is dependent on the type of pollutant. The less water-soluble the gas, the further down it will penetrate the respiratory tree. This means that sulfur dioxide is mainly absorbed in the conducting airways, whereas ozone and nitrogen dioxide spread to the lower respiratory tract and penetrate to the alveoli. The penetration depth of particulate matter depends on the particle size. Particles larger than 10 micrometer are kept in the mouth and nose. Smaller particles penetrate the respiratory tract, and particles smaller than 2 to 3 micrometer enter the alveolar region. Ultrafine particles can enter the respiratory tract even more deeply and can enter the bloodstream and so translocate to other organs. Oxidative stress leading to local and systemic inflammation is suggested as the main mechanism underlying the adverse effects of air pollution. Children are thought to be at greater risk of adverse effects from air pollution than healthy adults for several reasons. One reason is the higher exposure resulting from a higher minute ventilation and thus breathing larger volumes of air relative to their body size. And from larger amounts of time spent outdoors being physically active when playing. Another reason is that their immune system and organs are still developing and immature and therefore more susceptible to air pollution effects. Before we started our work on the long-term effects of ambient air pollution on children's lungs in the birth cohort, we already knew that ambient air pollution could exacerbate asthma, existing asthma in children. We knew that from panel and time series studies, the link day-to-day -day variation in exposure with day-to-day -day variation in health outcomes. And this is one example of such a panel study, a panel study of 900 asthmatics from seven US urban communities, where they linked five-day average NO2 and PM2.5 exposures to a series of symptoms and lung function. And they found that after days with higher levels of NO2, these kids experienced more wheezing and more nighttime asthma. And both PM2.5 and NO2 exposure were associated with a higher likelihood of missing school and a lower FEV1, which is a marker for bronchial obstruction. What we didn't know at that time is whether air pollution exposure could cause asthma in children and how air pollution exposure affects lung function growth through childhood and adolescence into adulthood. And this is where the birth cohort studies come into the picture. A lot of what we know to date about the long-term consequences of air pollution exposure for asthma development and lung function growth in children comes from what we call the European mature birth cohorts. Mature birth cohorts as opposed to other younger cohorts. These are five cohorts from Sweden, the United Kingdom, Germany and the Netherlands that were all started in the 1990s to study the determinants of asthma and allergies in children. Air pollution was not one of these determinants from the very beginning, but very soon became an important focus of these cohorts. The cohorts vary in size from 1,000 to almost 6,000, but use very similar methods. And therefore, they did not only publish a series of single cohort papers on these associations, but they also collaborated in a couple of multi-cohort efforts, about which I will tell you more in a second. One of the large collaborations in which the mature birth cohorts participated is the so-called ESCAPE project. In ESCAPE, we built lentis regression models for nitrogen oxides for more than 30 European study areas with existing cohorts and lentis regression models for particulate matter for a smaller number of these areas. 
In brief, we performed dedicated air pollution measurement campaigns and measured nitrogen oxides, soot, PM2.5, PM10, and PM cores, calculated annual average concentrations, and then used stochastic modeling together with data from geographic information systems on proximity to sources and data on regional background air pollution concentrations to describe the spatial variability in air pollution levels. We then used these models to estimate individual exposures to air pollution for the participants of the cohorts in the study areas and to assess the health effects of air pollution. ESCAPE was not limited to birth cohort studies. It also included adult cohorts, which allowed us to assess the impact of air pollution across the entire lifespan, from pregnancy outcomes at the very beginning to mortality at the other end, and respiratory morbidity, cardiovascular morbidity, urological effects, and cancer in between. This means what I'm going to present today is just a small part of the entire ESCAPE project. For the epidemiological analysis within ESCAPE, we decided that we would not transfer any cohort data, assuming that this would increase the willingness of the cohorts to participate and result in a larger number of cohorts. Each cohort analyzed their data according to a standardized statistical analysis plan, and we then subsequently applied meta-analysis to combine the cohort-specific association estimates. A limitation of this approach is that statistical power is limited to assess rare outcomes or to study subgroups or interaction effects. Another disadvantage is if less experienced sensors are involved, that you are limited to more standard statistical methods. Because of these limitations, we took a different approach when we performed the MEDAL project a few years later. MEDAL is another large collaborative project limited to birth cohort studies, and there we required the transfer of cohort data, which resulted in a smaller number of birth cohorts compared to ESCAPE. That's a downside. We built a harmonized central database, which is a good thing once you have it, but quite a lot of work to establish and to agree on common definitions and the data that actually should go into the database. But the good thing is once you have it, you are free to use any advanced statistical method you want to use. You can do pooled analyses and have sufficient statistical power to study rare outcomes and interactions. Before I come to the exposure health relationships, I want to say a few words about the exposures in the mature birth cohorts. Here you can see the annual average 2. PM 2.5 concentrations, and as you can see, they are lower in the Swedish BAMSA cohort and the UK MARS cohort than in the German and Dutch cohorts. You can also see that variability in exposure is very small for the uh, UK cohort and much larger in the other cohorts. And exposures for all cohorts are below the current EU limit value. This graph shows the results from the MEDAL project. It shows the associations between air pollution exposure and asthma incidence from birth until age 16 from a pooled analysis of the Swedish, German and Dutch mature birth cohorts. The figure shows associations with five air pollutants. In the top row, we have from left to right NO2 and PM2.5 absorbance as a marker of soot. and the bottom row, we have PM2.5, PM10 and PM coarse mass concentrations. Each panel shows overall associations across all ages, represented by black circles, as well as age-specific associations from models with exposure age interaction terms for a range of ages common to all cohorts, represented by gray circles. As you can see, especially the traffic-related air pollutants of NO2 and PM2.5 absorbance are positively associated with asthma. The age-specific associations vary until age 4, but are consistently positive from age 6 onwards, where asthma can be diagnosed much more reliably. Additional evidence for a causal role of traffic-related air pollution in the development of childhood asthma comes from other birth and children cohort studies. This figure is taken from a recent review paper by Hanin Kreis and colleagues, 
who reviewed and, meet and meta-analyzed associations between NO2 and asthma development in childhood from cohort studies and reported, despite some heterogeneity between cohorts, an overall positive and statistically significant association. We recently expanded the metal analysis within our Piyama birth cohort study by adding data from two additional rounds of follow-up performed at ages 17 and 20 years. The figure presents overall and age-specific associations from these analyses for the different air pollutants. Age-specific associations for the new follow-ups are highlighted by the red ovals. As this is a single cohort analysis, numbers are small and confidence intervals are wide. However, the findings suggest that the associations between air pollution exposure and asthma development persists into young adulthood. If confirmed by others, this would close the gap between the children's cohorts and the limited number of adult cohorts reporting positive associations between air pollution and asthma onset. And it would suggest that the causal role of air pollution and asthma development is not limited to children. An advantage of the birth cohorts over other children's and adults' cohorts is the availability of residential histories from birth, which allows us to assess the relevance of exposure at specific ages, at least in theory. In practice, we found in many cohorts that despite the fact that the participants change address during the follow-up, correlations between exposures at different ages remain high, and consequently associations are similar for birth address exposures and more later childhood exposures. This figure shows the correlation for NO2 at all follow-ups until age 20 in the Piyama cohort. As you can see, only at age 20, when many participants have moved out of the parental home, correlations become lower. The same pattern has been observed for the other pollutants. This means that we are not able to disentangle the relevance of exposure at different ages during childhood. However, we most likely will be able to disentangle the role of childhood and adulthood exposure and future analysis with adult asthma and other health outcomes. Let's now turn to lung function. In the ESCAPE project, we perform cross-sectional analyses of associations between air pollution exposure and lung function at primary school age in the mature birth cohorts. We assessed associations with exposures at the birth address and exposures at the current address at the time of lung function measurement to see whether early life or more recent exposure is more relevant for lung function. We performed cohort-specific analyses and subsequent meta-analyses, and both cohort-specific and combined association estimates are presented here in the figure. As you can see, there is some heterogeneity in associations between cohorts, but overall, we found statistically significant decreases in FEV1 in relation to NO2, NOx, PM2.5 absorbance, and PM2.5 at the current address, but not at the birth address, and no significant associations with the larger particles of PM10 and PM cores. Effects were generally small in the order of a few percent. That is consistent with what has been reported from other cohorts and cross-sectional studies, and may not be very impressive. But these small shifts in the distribution of FEV1 on the population level translate into considerable increases in the risk of having a clinically low lung function. As you can see here, increases in risk of clinically low lung function ranged from 33% for NOx to 85% for PM2.5 absorbance. Evidence for the persistence of the effects on childhood lung function into adolescence and adulthood is still limited. But the Swedish Bamse study recently published associations with lung function at age 16, and findings from this analysis suggest that associations persist at least into adolescence. Findings also suggest that associations with air pollution might be stronger in males than in females and may be restricted to non-asthmatics and participants that were not exposed to environmental tobacco smoke. Again, effects seem small in the order of a few milliliters, but also here, the small shifts at the population level translate into considerable increases in the risk of having a lung function below the lower limit of normal.
The PIAMA study has also extended analysis from the ESCAPE project. They included data from two additional lung function measurements performed at ages 12 and 16 years and performed longitudinal analysis with lung function growth from age 8 to 16 years. As you can see, air pollution exposure is associated with a reduced growth in FEV1, but not FEC during that eight year period. This suggests that air pollution exposure is associated with increased airway obstruction during childhood and adolescence, but not lung volume. It also suggests that the gap between those who are exposed to high and low levels of air pollution increases with age if exposure continues. This table shows results for exposure at the preschool period, but associations were very similar for other periods of exposure as expected from the high correlations between exposures at different ages. The findings of a reduced lung function growth in relation to air pollution exposure in Piyama confirm the findings that have been published by the Children's Health Study several years ago, one of the major cohort studies in this field. The Children's Health Study is not a birth cohort, but it's a cohort of children from a series of communities in Southern California that were about 10 years old at recruitment. So a potential limitation is the lack of information on exposures prior to recruitment at age 10. However, given the potentially high correlations between exposures at different ages during childhood, this may not be a serious limitation. Few other longitudinal studies of the association between air pollution exposure and lung function growth to childhood and adolescence have been published so far. The mechanisms underlying the adverse health effects of air pollution exposure are not clear yet. Experimental studies suggest that oxidative stress, inflammation and mitochondrial dysfunction may contribute to the effects, but the involved mechanisms remain unclear. Recent studies suggest that air pollution exposure may induce epigenetic modifications and that these modifications can have long-lasting effects on gene expression and cell function. In this epigenome-wide meta-analysis within several cohorts, including the metal cohorts and the children's health study, epigenome-wide significant associations were found between maternal NO2 exposure during pregnancy and DNA methylation in newborns at three CPG sites. All three genes are involved in mit mitochondria function, and mitochondria are known to play an important role in several key pathways of cellular responses to environmental stresses, including response to reactive oxygen spe species, nutrient and ATP sensing, and DNH damage response. In another EWORS within these cohorts, with prenatal PM exposure, significant association with methylation differences were found in several genes of relevance for respiratory health, such as FAM13A and NOTCH4. Besides the growing body of evidence for adverse effects of air pollution on lung function in childhood, there is also evidence for reductions in exposure having beneficial effects on children's lungs, providing supportive evidence for a causal relationship like this study within the children's health study. In this study of 110 children, they looked at lung function growth in relation to changes in exposure due to changes in residential address. As you can see, FEV1 growth was larger in those who moved to an area with lower levels of air pollution in the left part of the graph than in those who moved to an area with higher levels of air pollution in the right half. Similar associations with changes in air pollution exposure were found for the mid-expiratory flow and the peak expiratory flow here showed in the bottom row, but not for the forced vital capacity. While moving to areas with cleaner air might be a solution at the individual level, this is definitely not a solution to the problem at the population level. To improve children's lung health and to promote healthy aging at the population level, policy measures are needed to reduce exposure. A more recent study within three cohorts of the Children's Health Study nicely demonstrates the benefits from long-term improvements in air quality. They assess lung function growth in relation to the changes in air pollution levels in five communities in the period from 1994 to 2011 shown here.
the reductions in air pollution exposure in these five communities were associated with measurable improvements in lung function growth from age 11 to 15 years for both FEV1 and FEC. And, and this is not shown here, it was associated with significant reductions in the proportion of children with a clinically low FEV1. To summarize, what have we learned from the birth cohorts and other children's cohorts during the past two decades? First of all, we have learned that air pollution exposure has long-lasting consequences for our children's lungs, as it is associated with increased risks of asthma and reduced lung function and lung function growth in childhood and adolescence. Moreover, we have learned that the current EU limit values are not safe, as associations were observed at air pollution levels well below these limit values. And finally, it has been shown that improvements in air quality have positive effects on lung function, providing evidence in support of policy measures to reduce air pollution levels. Besides everything we have learned, there are many things that we don't know yet and that are targets for future research. For example, we don't know yet to what extent the deficits in lung function that we see in adolescents will persist into adulthood and whether, for example, adolescents with a low lung function will also be have a low maximum attained lung function level in early adulthood, which put them at an increased risk of developing COPD. Moreover, we don't know anything about the effect of air pollution on the small airways, which play a key role in COPD, but are poorly reflected in the currently used lung function measures such as FEV1. And finally, currently very little is known about the relevance of exposure to ultrafines fine particles which are so abundant and can deeply penetrate into our lungs. But all the things that we don't know yet should not prevent us from taking actions to improve air quality and to lower limit values as this will improve the respiratory health of our children. I would like to close my presentation with a big thank you to everybody who has been involved in this research over the past decades and without whom this wouldn't have been possible. I'd like to start with the cohort participants, also, also mention the funding agencies, and I'd like to thank all the field workers and researchers that have been involved over the years. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And I attach a list of recent review papers for those who are interested in learning more about the topic.